Hey everyone, today we're going to be going over pharmacology basics, uh, but mostly how to read and write prescriptions. It's a really important concept that everybody needs to know, and if you have any other questions about anything else pharmacology related, we're making lots of videos about all of this in a wonderful little series, including lots of math. So let's get started. My name's Dr. Kendall Wyatt, and um, that's me. So let's get started with what we're going to talk about. The most important thing is to really understand how prescriptions are written. Um, and that's what we're going to go over. We're going to go over how they're written and really uh, give some good examples of how you can understand how they're written and why and how, things you need to know. Now, the recipe, prescriptions are like a recipe for anything. There's a standard format of really what you need to know. Why do you need to follow this format? Well, the big thing is it reduces medication errors. Medication errors are literally rampant. Um, and it's just one of the things that just keep happening. And one of the reasons uh, that we can reduce this is by following the exact same uh, patterns every single time. Why are airplanes so safe? Well, pilots always follow a checklist every single time before they take off, checking every single thing. And that's exactly what we'd have to do. So to even for prescriptions, they kind of always follow the same process as the written. And then there's some outliers of other things you need to know. Um, now, the other thing, uh, you've really got to make sure that you need to know, whether you're a, a provider or you're a nurse or whoever, um, really just to make sure you know that the prescription that you're getting is complete. Um, does it have all the pieces of information? And just stopping right there as soon as it's given to you so that you know everything's there on, on, the, on the script. Now, of course, also being able to know what's being handed from uh, maybe the provider to the patient, you can also explain it and make sure you can explain exactly what they've given um, and what is going on. And of course, uh, the most important thing about all this stuff is test questions are written just like prescriptions almost all the time. So you really can understand really easily how to, what test questions are asking, which is the most important thing. Now, the most important concept is only complete prescriptions get filled. A prescription comes to the pharmacy and it's incomplete. It's missing something. Well, it can't be filled. Um, now, sometimes they, you know, the pharmacist will try to figure it out or maybe they can know. Maybe they're refilling something that was already there. But if it's not complete, it's not going to get filled. So what happens is it stops. It's got to go back to the uh, the 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 provider or who it has to be clarified. If you're a nurse and you're getting an order um, of a prescription that you're going to give in the hospital or whatnot, and it's not complete, then you have to stop, call that provider back and say, hey, um, how are we going to give this? What's the other additional information? And it's really just a uh, pain. So if you're getting them right away, then if you know all the pieces that are supposed to be there, then you can clarify them right away. Now, all the parts that go into complete prescriptions include a lot of pieces. Now, we're going to talk about these individually as we go through them, but the patient demographic information, the drug that you're giving, the strength and the amount, the route that you're supposed to give it, the frequency it's supposed to be given, the number that's supposed to be dispensed and actually given to that patient, and then, of course, how many refills. Now, we're going to go over a couple of other, um, other things that happen aside from the really basic prescription as, as far as controlled medications and um, some other, just other little things that you've got to know. And we're going to go over those, each of those individually. Now, I like to learn with scenarios, so we're going to go through scenarios as we do these. So you can fill them out or you can just follow along, whatever works for you. It just depends. Uh, whatever you think is a little bit more fun. I just enjoy torturing poor Joe Schmuckatelli. Now, the first scenario, Joe Schmuckatelli's prescribed the medication lisinopril for hypertension. He will take a 10 milligram tablet each day and receive a month's supply of the medication. Now this is what you know. Maybe this is a scenario that you know is supposed to happen and you're going to get the prescription. Maybe you want to give the, uh, Joe this prescription. Whether you're writing it or you're receiving it, you still really need to know how it's going to be written. So you've got to know first off, what's the, what's the strength of the actual pill that's going to be given? And that's something you can look up whether you're going to look it up in Hippocrates or Micromedics or whatever uh, resource that you, you want to use. There are tons of resources out there, all free. And of course, some paid ones which have other information in there as well, which you can check out. And if you don't know the uh, strength of the medication, then there's always pharmacy there to help you out as well because you can always consult them. So what is it actually going to look like? Let's look at what we're actually trying to make first, and then we're going to decipher it and break it down piece by piece and go over how you actually build, uh, build it all up. So the final result should be lisinogen lisinopril or lisinopril, 10 milligrams, one tab by mouth daily. Dispense num number 30, no refills. So let's break this down of how we got to this and all those pieces individually and what they all mean. And of course, then we'll go over abbreviations and some other things because this is the basic one. And of course, they get more complex as we go. Now, I've got this designed out to actually break out each of the pieces of what goes into a, 
uh, to a complete prescription. Now, those are all of those pieces that were in there in the beginning. So now I'm, I'm only going to mention this once, but you will always have our demographic information on there. Um, that's going to be part of that prescription pad. But um, depending on where you, where you reside and whatnot, typically you've got to have two pieces of identifying information, usually the patient's name and their date of birth. Um, some, place, some, some places and localities and whatnot require more information. It really just depends. But at a minimum, you usually have to have those two on a written prescription. So let's look at the first part. So each of these are broken down. So the first thing is the drug. What medication are you actually going to give? And of course you can write that. Now you can write the generic name as we've written here, or you could write the trade name. Um, it just, it doesn't depend, it doesn't matter, but I find it easier, um, unless you're specifically trying to give the uh, brand name, uh, then you could put that in there. But if you write a brand name, um, then you actually, and you want the patient to receive the brand name of the medication, you actually have to indicate that specifically that they should be getting the actual brand name of the medication. Because as uh, we all know, uh, medications get filled and they're always going to be given usually the generic name, uh, the generic drug by default. So the next part's the strength. So what is the actual strength of the medication you need to give? Now, this is where it gets a little confusing because there's a lot of different variables here. Um, the medications come in different strengths and quantities, and maybe you need to, maybe the dose that needs to be given is different than the, what's available. So I like to look up in Hippocrates or Up to Date or uh, Micromedics, any of the resources, and find out what uh, prescription strengths are available. I also like GoodRx. It's a great resource to go in and see what those medication dosages are and how they're going to come at particular pharmacies. So I can look and see, well, Lisinopril comes in a lot of different forms. It comes in uh, 2.5, 5, 10, and um, 20 milligrams. It comes in lots of different strengths. And of course, it's there's other combinations of, of lisinopril as well. But I know that there's a 10 milligram tab, so that's great. 10 milligrams, and I want to give, the next thing is, well, how many of these 10 milligram tabs do I want to give? Well, I just want to give one, and one tab. And it's really important to give what that is, because there are different things that you may be giving. Maybe it's one puff if you're giving an, an uh, inhaler. Maybe it's, um, uh, well, we'll talk about some other things in there, but maybe it's one tab. Maybe it's one capsule. Now, is it really important? Is it is it is it going to be the end of the world if you write tab and it's actually given in capsules? Eh, usually not, because those are the kind of things that the pharmacy will infer. And they know that, well, this must have just been a mistake because lisinopril comes in a tablet, not a capsule. Um, and there's, at least I'm not aware of any specific instances where that's really, really important. So those are the kind of things that uh, maybe not as important, but you would say one tab, because basically you want them to give one, one tab or one dose of 10 milligrams at a time. Now, the next thing is the route. Now, we're not going to go over, we're not going to talk about all of the routes of administration. That's in a different fundamentals, uh, fundamental pharmacology uh, video that we make. But there are lots of different routes to give the medication. This is super important. Now, the thing you've got to do, know is, now, lisinopril is super easy. Um, it's a tablet, and the tablet goes in, in, in the mouth. But how do you want to give it? And there's lots of different ways, and we're going to talk about abbreviations for those in a second. So by mouth. Now, when I'm not I'm sure if, if I have abbreviation, which we're going to talk about again in a second, I usually just write it out by mouth. Um, if, you know, so sometimes I can't remember a, um, per rectum or rectally. So I actually just write out rectally for suppositories uh, because I can never remember that it's um, PR is the abbreviation. I don't really like that one. Now, once we know... Um, uh, but of course, you got to make sure you're choosing the right one. So we wouldn't want to give lisinopril rectally. Um, that just would not be a very fair choice for Joe, and it's not going to be a very good therapeutic effect of the medication. If you're not get caught on by uh, this far yet, I really like to pick on Joe. I mean, he might be a nice guy, but I like to pick on him. I can't help it. So the next thing is the frequency. How often is this medication supposed to be given? There are lots of different frequencies, and we're going to talk about the abbreviations with those um, in just a moment. But the frequency, how often is that medication supposed to get, be given? So how often is the 10 milligram, one tab of 10 milligram lisinopril supposed to be given? Well, we want to give it to them once a day. We can give it to them daily. We can give it to them twice a day. We could give it to them depending on how the medication is indicated. And of course, these can vary. Drugs can be given every two hours. Drugs can be given um, once a day, every other day. Um, they can be given at night. They can be given in the morning. And those are things that would be not notated right here in the frequency part. So this is just like building little building blocks of your sentence all the way up until you get it all the way built. Now, the next thing. Now, essentially, this is the end of the prescription, as we'll call it. But the other key important things that are, especially for a written prescription or for anything, you've really got to know how many that should be given. 
Now, what does this really tell you, the dispense number 30? Well, what is it? Well, it's the quantity. Um, now, number means, you know, the amount. Dispense number of 30. So that means 30 tabs are going to be dispensed. Mm, okay, makes sense. 30 tabs are going to be dispensed. Now, the one thing that, if, that you have to know is, is this enough quantity for what Joe Schmuckatelli was supposed to be given? So essentially, I know that this total quantity, because he's going to be getting one tab every day by mouth, is this is a 30-day supply. So this is a 30-day supply of lisinopril. That's exactly what we need to give him, is 30-day supply. Now, we're giving him a 30-day supply. Why do we give 30 days? Well, we give 30 days for a lot of different reasons. Number one, most insurances don't pay for medications beyond 30 days at a time. Now, there are, you're probably thinking, well, I know, you know, my aunt's uncle's friend who gets all of their prescriptions in 90 days. Well, typically what insurance companies do is they'll partner with mail order subscriptions. You can get 90 day subscriptions of medications, but you have to send those in and then they have to be sent to you in 90 day, uh, 90 day amounts. Why do we not like to give them for more than 30 days? Well, a couple of different reasons, but there's uh, because of the fact that maybe medication dosages change and those medications may actually go to waste, but also because patients usually come and see when they're in the early control of a, of a, of a diagnosis, they usually are seen in 30 day intervals. So we give them 30 days and that's just what insurance companies typically pay for. They're not going to pay for more than 30 days at once. So even if you wrote a prescription that's for 35 days, the pharmacy is probably only going to fill it for 30 days because that's just how it works. Now the last part that um, again is not part of this by way, but when you're writing a prescription, you need to know how many refills are supposed to be given. Now refills are interesting because refills essentially um, this by itself is one 30-day amount. So refills are how many additional 30-day amounts need to be given. And this is something that gets confused when people are writing these in the beginning. So if you give somebody a prescription, I gave Joe this, this uh, prescription right here for lisinopril for 30 days. I want him to have a three-month supply. So how many more refills does he need? Two. Now, typically the maximum refills in most things are a total of six months for a prescription, and there are some occurrences where you could do 12 um, and di different things, but typically you're looking at about six months. So you usually would see um, and med each medication some are, are, are managed a lot differently. So that's just important to know. But we would want to make sure we gave um, two additional refills to give Joe his lisinopril for three months. So that would give him a total of 90 pills subscription, but he'd have to return every month to the pharmacy or call in and get it refilled um, in 30-day increments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there's a lot of special things that you've got to know when, when um, or not a lot of special things. There are several important things to know that are special considerations when it comes to uh, prescriptions. And this is where a lot of the confusing stuff always comes in. The big one is abbreviations. We're going to talk about approved abbreviations and things you shouldn't use. And then also making sure the number one thing everyone always forgets when they're first learning, including myself, when I was first learning how uh, prescriptions were written, were um, the as needed and the indications. Now, controlled substances are kind of their own animal at the end, and we're going to talk about those as well. And then at the end of this, I guess, like I said, we're going to run through a lot of examples of how these work. Now, the first thing we're talking about abbreviations. Abbreviations can be broken down in two distinct areas when we talk when we talk about writing prescriptions. We've got our route abbreviations and we've got the frequency abbreviations. So we've got abbreviations that are for the route and abbreviations for the frequency. And we're going to talk about each of those individually um, at, right now, actually. Sorry. <clears throat> Just losing my mind here. I need to get a bigger straw. Uh, anyway, so as we, <clears throat> excuse me, as we talk about um, route abbreviations, so abbreviations, route of administration, commonly things that are used. Now, common things that are used. Now, this is a big list, so I'm not going to go through and drill in each one of these. But essentially, they're all of the routes, most commonly that medications are administered. The biggest ones, the most common one you're going to see is PO. PO is by mouth. PO is a very commonly uh, used abbreviation. We use it in tons of different things. And these are common, common abbreviations. IM for intramuscular, IV for intravenous. Of course, those are all used very commonly and you're going to see it all the time. Those are the ones you, you just have to know. Um, the rest of them, to be honest, almost all of the rest of them, except for apply to the affected area, Almost all the rest of them, I just write out because I don't remember 
SL sublingual. I just think it's easier for my own brain to write out sublingual or topical because TP just makes me think of toilet paper. But um, the biggest thing, when you ever have a question about what an abbreviation is, just write it out. You can't go wrong doing that. And in all honesty, um, it's actually suggested but to reduce errors that you always do write everything out. But as we go fast, PO is something um, definitely that's uh, gonna you're going to see every single day with all your medications. Now, frequency. These are the ones that confuse people the most. These uh, abbreviations, and there's a couple of uh, free, very commonly used ones that you just have to know. Now, excuse me, the first uh, ones are multiple times per day. Now, you're going to see um, the one that's not on here is daily, and that, we're going to talk about that because you're not supposed to use it. We'll talk about that in the next slide. But we've got BID, TID, and QID. Now, they can be written um, lowercase, uppercase, with uh, periods in between them. It really doesn't matter. They all mean the same thing. BID means twice per day. Um, TID is three times a day, and QID four times a day. So essentially, four times daily they're supposed to take the medication. That's not at specific timed intervals. It's just four times per day. We hope that they space them out, but um, it's not supposed to be specific times. Now, the next thing is just to know, um, this one, which is really common, is QHS. Now, again, Q, could, this could be capitalized or lowercase or with periods, but QHS means at the hour of sleep, HS, and uh, or just bedtime. So you want to give that Q means every, um, essentially what it means in when it's, when it's put with a time or whatnot. Q means every, so every hour of sleep. Other things are specific timed intervals that you'll see. Um, you'll see Q4H, which is very often. You could use QH, Q, every four number, and then H means hours. So Q four hours, Q two hours, Q one hour, Q five hours, Q eight hours, Q 12 hours, depending on the point of using hours versus twice a day or three times a day. Three times a day, of course, is uh, three times a day, TID. And of course, why is it BID, TID, and QID? Well, that's because those are derived from the Latin uh, the Latin form of words. Now, why do we want to use TID instead of every eight hours? Well, TID means three times per day. And typically, um, three times a day to most patients does not mean on an eight-hour rigorous schedule. That doesn't mean that, and that just means three times daily. That means when they're awake, typically, that they would take that medication. Um, now, Q8 hours would mean every eight hours, you're supposed to take that medication exactly at that time. Now, of course, yes, when we say BID, we mean that you should take it about every 12 hours, but it's not a strict rule. So they're kind of interchangeable, but just understand certain medications do need to adhere by a certain rigorous schedule, something like vancomycin. Um, so if we're giving vancomycin every 12 hours or every 8 hours, it's really important that those are started on those exact hours, and we would use Q8 hours for that because it needs to be specific. Now, the next thing are abbreviations that you need to avoid. Now, depending on whether you're the hospital system that you're, you're associated with uses um, JCO or Joint Commission, rather, or, um, or whichever um, uh, organization that they use to for accreditation, um, JCO, Joint Commission, actually have a, a, a abbreviation list that is um, not to be used. And this is what those are. And these are abbreviations, really, that in general, all everyone should avoid because they're just so commonly, uh, commonly confused. And that's U for unit. Um, or you or you know lowercase or uppercase because it just to just spell out unit. It's very commonly confused as well as international units or I use. Now the one that gets everyone every single time is QD, QD or QOD. This is the number one that gets confused all the time. And you can see in my example here I wrote out daily. Daily is always supposed to be wrote, written out because. QD and QOD is confused with QID. And those three in of themselves all get confused all the time. And they that's just a really bad habit um, that you don't want to start. So you want to make sure that you don't use um, daily. QD is not an approved abbreviation. So there are some other ones that are on there, you know, like not writing MS for morphine sulfate, um, not, not using... Um, uh, MGSO4 for magnesium sulfate. You should write those out. But the, we're just talking about actual prescription um, as far as frequency. Um, but there's a few others. If you want to look them up, you can Google it and you'll find them right away. Now, um, the next thing that we, I want to talk about are some special use cases, kind of the special things that are going on that you need to know about as you're writing, uh, writing and reading prescriptions. One of the things is um, medications that are indicated PRN or as needed. So PRN means as needed. Um, so 
uh, PRN as needed. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, one of the things that's, include, that's important to know, if a medication that is prescribed has special indications or special considerations, they have to be spelled out very clearly. So um, if we use PRN, so if I wrote um, a mod medication needs to be given Q8 hours, PRN or as needed, well, it has to have an indication. Why are they using it only sparingly? They need that indication as to why they're actually giving it, why they need to take it at that eight hours. Well, they should take it for pain, um, and that could be on there. And that pain could be more specific. It should, it could say in a hospital setting for pain at a scale of um, five to ten, or seven to ten, or whatever it is. It could be very specific, or it could be a little bit more broad. As we write most pain medications, um, they're written, um, you know every so many hours, PRN for pain, as needed for pain. Um, another thing that is just an important consideration is to know that it could be around vital signs or essentially anything. Um, and this is where the, they'll just be written out and it needs to be clear. So one of the things that's um, often an indication or, or a very specific one is um, you use a medication Q4 hours every four hours um, uh, if the blood pressure is above 150 over 90. So it will be used every four hours if needed, basically. But basically, the medication is supposed to be given if the blood pressure is over 150 over 90 here. And of course, because I like to pick on Joe, um, you know, a medication should be used daily as needed for hemorrhoids. What does that really mean? Well, that means that you shouldn't be using more than once a day of that medication for hemorrhoids. So if you need to use it twice a day, that's against the medication and you're going to run out. Um, so we, that's, that's why that's there. Same for pain. Q8 hours. Well, if you're taking the medication every four hours, that's not the way the medication is supposed to be uh, taken. And that's, again, you know, you're gonna, they're going to run out of medication. There's not going to be enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But these are really important things. Now, the last thing before we get into running through some examples are controlled medications. Controlled medications um, are really important uh, to make sure there's a few considerations you need to know. But most importantly, these vary by state. So there are federal guidelines about controlled substances, which are managed by the... Um, Controlled Substances Act, and then regulated by the FDA. But essentially, that's the umbrella. And then underneath of that, the states can uh, make more restrictions uh, based on all of those particular things from the state level. They can um, limit certain things by provider level. So um, in, I think, 22 states now, I think, um, nurse practitioners can work independently. But in those other states, nurse practitioners maybe can't write controlled medications, or they have to have a co-signature. They can only write controlled medications for a few days. Um, and there are certain things around each one of those, and those all vary by state, and we're not going to go into it. But the big umbrella rules, the things that really apply across the board, is that when you when a prescription is written for a controlled substance, so a scheduled substance, um, the quantity, when we look at the quantity number, so how many, dispense number of 30, that number needs to be spelled out, written out as 30. Dispense number 17, you need to write out 17 on there. That actually decreases fraud, because what happens is 30, then the patient will just go in and sometimes they can easily change it to 300, or they can change it to 130. And that's something that's really um, uh, ruling out a lot of that because you spell out the entire word. And a pharmacy may actually deny the prescription if it's not done. They have that right, um, or they can clarify and call, um, just FYI. So it, technically without that, it's an incomplete controlled substance prescription. Control, controlled substances also do not allow refills. So every controlled substance that's written is not going to be able to be written for five refills. If, if, a, if a patient's on, uh, hopefully not, but if they are on um, uh, something like oxycodone every single day and they've taken it for years, they have to have a prescription that's every month going for that, that particular refill. They can't just have a prescription that automatically refills every month. Um, that's for a multitude of reasons, but also it... Uh, these controlled medications, they're controlled and scheduled medications because of the risk of dependency and abuse, and that's why those medications aren't allowed. Furthermore, of course, for the exact same reason, medications typically don't allow for more than 30-day supply of the medications. Um, I do know, yes, there are providers that will write for maybe you know four times the amount of medication every day um, because the patient can take it for four months. That is that is not allowed. Um, it is 100% against um, against the rules as far as um, using you know things for pain medication and whatnot. It shouldn't be done, um, and that's uh, that's that's a that's a big no no. 
And of course, the last thing I think is pretty common is tamper-resistant paper. It needs to be printed out in most places. Or, and because of the use of new technology, there's special electronic authentication software that can be used in some states, in some locations. Um, and I think it's going to be a thing of the future, just because that way we can keep, um, as we're having a lot more registries that keep electronic systems that keep track of all these medications. Um, so maybe what um, you know a provider can actually send um, a pain medication electronically, but it requires their fingerprint or something like that. And those have to be systems that are all set up. Um, that's not available every year, but it's it's something that's definitely coming. Along with that, um, uh, the um, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Anyway, um, but um, it's really important to know about controlled substances. Oh, I didn't remember what it was. So the other thing with controlled substances is that they are controlled at the uh, pharmacy level. Um, as far as reporting, there's a reporting system. So all of the controlled substances that are written by a particular provider, um, and I think it's pretty much consistent in every state now. Um, I think there, you know, years ago that they, they didn't have every state. I think every state is on board now. But uh, every state has a, a database where if you're getting a narcotic pain medication, a Schedule II, Schedule Three medication, um, those medications are reported in, who wrote it, what DEA number wrote it, and then all those reports can be ran by the patient, and you can see exactly when, where, and what they were done. That cuts down on doctor shopping and abuse and a lot of, uh, a lot of great things as far as the provider goes, um, the state goes, and the benefit of everyone. Um, that's really important. So let's look at this example for a controlled substance and how this medication prescription is different um, than um, our lisinopril one for Joe. So Joseph Schmuckatelli visited the ER for, for a severe burn. He's given a pain medication prescription for oxycodone 10 milligrams when discharged to be taken every four hours. He was given a five-day supply. So right now, if you want to write that down, you can actually go ahead and try to write that down um, and see if you can get out the pieces. So you, it's a good time to pause the video and see if you've got all the pieces, because here are all the pieces, the recipe that goes along with the beginning of the video right here. So let's work through these together. Here we go. So the first thing we know, let's look at our formula. Let's bring our formula up for what needs to be there. Here's our actual formula. So if you were having trouble or you didn't really remember all the pieces, now you can pause it and put in all the pieces. So let's run through it together. So first thing's the drug. Well, the drug he's gonna be given is oxycodone. Now oxycodone is a scheduled medication and it's, um, it has a high uh, moderate, moderate to high risk of abuse. So this is a controlled medication. So oxycodone, well, what's the strength? Well, you could look up the tabs here. So we know that oxycodone, specifically uh, roxycodone comes in a, uh, oxycodone comes in, we can give 10 milligrams in a strength. Now, how many, what's the amount? What, how much do we need to give of oxycodone? So we've said 10 milligrams. Well, how much do they need to give? Well, we want them to take one tab. But what if the pharmacy that you send them to, they only have five milligrams? Well, the pharmacy will automatically change that prescription to 10 milligrams, two tabs, because that's the same amount of medication that that patient's going to be given. So those kind of things just kind of require you to be in to sure that whatever the dose that's on there is correct, um, and try to make sure that you're picking the right tab for the particular pharmacy that the pay, or, you know, for what's available in the area. So the amount. Now, what's the route? Well, medications, we're going to give this medication orally because it'd be very difficult for him to get this type of medication IV or IM or, or sub-Q or whatever, any other way at home. And of course, we wouldn't want to be too mean to Joe and give him it to him uh, rectally. Of course, it's not going to be absorbed as well. So the route's, of course, going to be by mouth. Now, of course, I could use PO here. I could write in PO and use that, and that's perfectly okay. Um, you're allowed to do that. So oxycodone, 10 milligrams, one tab by mouth. So it's in, indicated by mouth. Now, how often are we going to give it to him? Now, here's where you need to think about this. Well, he needs to, be he needs to take the medication every four hours. So the first part of this is every four hours. But he, he's not supposed to take it every four hours on the clock, four hours, timer goes off, take my medication. He's only supposed to take that medication if he has pain. So what's, what's the thing here? Well, every four hours as needed. Every four hours PRN, every four hours as needed. So only if he needs it. Well, what's the need? What's the indication? Well, the indication here is what? Well, pain. So every four hours as needed for pain. If you don't have this for pain, this is the biggest mistake I see so many people, as needed for pain, they forget this, and then, well, it's not there, and it's incomplete subscri uh, subscription. Prescription. Um, I make that uh, common word 
mishap all the time. So the last part to make sure, and this is where um, you know all the math nerds, which I know everybody rolls their eyes when it comes to math, you need to think about how many actual pills need to be given um, to Joe. And this is really important because one of the things um, that's important is you don't really write a five-day supply. Uh, the provider is supposed to automatically calculate how many pills are supposed to be given. Now, maybe you're lucky. Maybe there's software that you're using that allows you to just automatically choose give enough for a five-day supply. Um, but that's not how the prescriptions are supposed to be written. You're supposed to write exactly how many actual tablets should be dispensed. So how many should be given? Well, you're supposed to take 10, uh, 10 milligrams, one tablet every four hours. So that means he needs enough for five days is what we want to give him. So how many pills would he be taking per day? Well, there's every four hours, six, four. So we know that he's going to be taking about six tablets every day. And if he were literally getting up every night and um, taking the medication literally on cl like clockwork. But that's what we possibly anticipate. So we want to give him 30 because we know we want to give him six times five is 30. So we want to write dispense and you can abbreviate dispense, but dispense number of 30. And of course, because this is a controlled medication, we write out the word 30. It must be written out. Now, um, what's the last thing is, of course, we're refills. Um, how many refills can we give him on this medication? Zilch. Because it's controlled medication, there are no refills. Um, I, you, most prescription pads or whatever have a space for refills by default. Um, but, um, you know, in case this were being written on a scrap of paper or whatever, which wouldn't be allowed, but if it was another, a different medication, um, you'd have to indicate how many refills are supposed to be given. And it's no uh, or none. Sometimes um, you, you write a zero. You wouldn't write a zero. Um, if you write a zero for no refills, you need to write a zero with a line through it. That's really important and a good thing to do because zero could be easily turned into 10. And the pharmacist, I hope, would catch that because that would be very rare and bizarre and, of course, a very uh, common indication that somebody's trying to abuse the medication prescription. So let's look at another one. Um, poor Joe. I, we're going to run through some practice ones here and go through some examples. Um, so this is just me picking on Joe, and I think it's fun. Joe Schmuckatelli's contracted genital herpes and experiencing his first flare-up. Poor Joe. Prescribe him a cyclovir. Now, if you're at the provider level and you want to look this up, that's great. I'd recommend you pause it right here and, um, and look it up on your own and write the actual prescription out um, for practice. But here's what uh, the actual prescription for acyclovir is or how it's um, indicated. So acyclovir is usually prescribed for 10 days for an initial outbreak at 200 milligrams, 200 milligrams five times per day while awake. So essentially, while he's awake, he takes the medication five times per day. So how are we going to write this prescription out? How do we fill all the pieces in to make sure that we've got a complete and accurate prescription for this medication? So let's run through it. So what's the medication? The drug, the medication name is acyclovir. You could use um, the trade name here if you like again. What's the strength? Well, I would look this up. And I know that, um, and when I do look it up, acyclovir is available in a 200 milligram uh, dose. And I'm, I want him to take 200 milligrams. I want him to take one 200 milligram capsule because if I told him to take two capsules, that'd be twice the amount. So how many 200 milligrams? I want him to take one. If acyclovir was only available in a 100 milligram, then I'd want him to take two, as we see. So whatever these two multiply together should equal my dose that I'm supposed to be giving every single time. Now, how we want um, Joe to take the acyclovir, we want him to take it by mouth or PO again. And how often? Well, we've got it right here, actually, five times per day. Now, there is no, um, there's no magic sauce to, um, or magic sauce, um, there's no abbreviation for five times per day that's commonly used. So we write out five times daily. And of course, we want to put that in here while awake, because we don't want um, Joe to actually get up or take this medication Q, um, you know, every five, five times a day divided out per hour. We don't want him to do that. Because we want him to sleep through the night, because we're nice, we're nice people, and as much as we like to pick on Joe, we want to, we feel bad for him because he's got herpes. You know, it happens. So um, this is really important: five times a day while awake. Now, indication: Do we have to give an indication? No, because this is not a special. Um, there's no special uh, things about this except for while awake. So that could be considered an indication. But there's no other special use cases of when he should and shouldn't take it other than while awake, which is really um, a suggestion uh, for him. So um, what's the quantity that we need to give? 
Well, let's calculate it. Calculating this, we've got how long do we want him to take this? So you could calculate a 30-day supply, but that would be incorrect. We only want him to take it for 10 days. How um, when we tell him, we tell him, Joe, you got to take this dose of, of acyclovir for 10 days, and this is a high dose that you're going to take to um, to stop the outbreak that you have because you've got your first flare-up. What? How many pills do you actually need to make it through those 10 days? Well. Five times a day is five pills per day times 10 days equals a quantity of 50. So it would say dispense number of 50. And of course, how many refills do we want him to give? Well, this is a, this is a, um, a flare-up dosage of medication, and we only want him to take it for 10 days and then stop. We don't want him to keep taking it 10 days this dose and then another 10 days right after that. That would be, um, that would be inappropriate because this dose is literally only intended for a 10-day uh, period of time. So, of course, no refills, because this is intended to be one time. Of course, if, if he came back, which magically is in the next question, um, the next scenario, then you would actually probably change the dose of what needs to go. What's really important is make sure you don't accidentally automatically just think everything's 30 days and calculate out that number. It gets a little confusing with them, with antibiotics especially, because antibiotics are all given for three days, five days, seven days, 10 days, 14 days, 30 days. Um, lots of different durations at all kinds of different hours. So you just need to do a calculation. And you can calculate the number of capsules, um, the, the number of um, the capsules per the dose, so however many of this equals, multiplied by the how many times per day, and of course, then the duration of the treatment. So, of course, Joe comes back. He returns for a follow-up now and needs a maintenance dose of acyclovir for long-term suppression of his herpes. Now we're going to get, he needs a long-term suppression for a total of three months. Now, again, if you're at the provider level and you're doing this, you're writing prescriptions, um, maybe you want to pause it and look this up and actually figure out all and see if you can get everything right away. But here's the hint of actually how acyclovir is prescribed. Acyclovir is actually given during maintenance therapies, typically given as a 400 milligram dose twice a day. So twice daily, you take 400 milligrams. Now let's just actually write that out because a lot of it's a lot similar to what we already did. So what's the drug? Well, it's acyclovir. What's the strength? Now, this is where it changes a little bit because the actual um, acyclovir actually comes in a 400 milligram dose. Now, I could give um, Joe 200 milligrams and have him take two 200 milligram tablets, or but that would be, or two 200, two 200 milligram capsules rather, but we always try to give the patients the least number of pills um, and the least number of frequency as humanly possible. And that's why lots of medications, especially like HIV medications, are constantly being reformulated and combined into newer HIV medications, which have less times per dose, and, or less times, uh, less number of doses rather, and of course less number of drugs or more drugs combined into one pill. And that's the same reason why we see um, something like Claritin. We see Claritin come out, and Claritin's indicated twice a day. And then we have Claritin, um, Claritin long-term, you know, so it works for 24 hours. It's a, it's a uh, you know, a uh, long-dose medication. So you only have to take it once a day. We see that pretty common because, as we know, patients just don't do very well taking multiple pills and multiple times per day. So as the number of times and number of pills go up, the less likely that they're going to complete the therapy. So uh, acyclovir, 400 milligrams, one tab. So what's the, what's the route? Of course, well, it's PO, so I could put by mouth or PO. And what's the frequency? Now, you could write twice a day, but here I've put in BID because I think it's shorter, and I like to use the abbreviations. So twice per day um, is what we would use. Could you use uh, Q12 hours? Yeah, you could, but the best way to do it is every uh, twice a day. Now, indication is irrelevant because there is no indication because he's supposed to take it twice a day no matter what. Um, and what's the quantity we want to give him? Well, we want him to take 400 milligrams, which is one tablet, so that's essentially one tablet per dose, twice a day, so one times two is two, and how many days we want to give him? Well, we want to give him 30-day supply at once, that's what you give, so a 30-day supply at once would be a quantity of 60, so a dispense number of 60. But if you remember, we want to give him three months, a three-month supply, so how many refills do we want to give him? Three? No, we don't give him three refills. Because this in and of itself is one 30-day supply. So refills are how many additional 30-day supplies does he need? Well, Joe is not going to see us again for three months, so we want to give him two refills of the medication. So essentially, as written, this is 90, um, 90 pills, or sorry, um, 
uh, 180 pills, which will be uh, 60 pills per month um, over three months. And that's how you can think through it. So let's do it, everyone, as they look a little bit differently. Now, Joe returns again. He's got gonorrhea. He needs a shot of ceftriaxone or rocephin. How should the order be written? So this is a great example, whether you're a provider or a nurse or what, who, anybody reading an order, of how ones really change and how they kind of evolve, but they still follow the exact same format. So again, if you know how rocephin, um, ceftriaxone is given, you want to pause right now because I'm going to spoil it for you um, before you get it all. So how do we give rocephin? Well, for gonorrhea, ceftri uh, ceftriaxone uh, or rocephin is given as a shot one time uh, intramuscularly, 250 milligrams. And I can tell you right now, um, not from personal experience, but from giving it, um, that shot's very painful. Um, so it's not a fun shot to give patients, and they just they don't they don't really like you after giving that one. But I I don't know. Sometimes I just kind of think it's like um, the punishment for getting gonorrhea. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm actually really nice to my patients, but um, I do warn them because this medication sometimes can cause a burning uh, burning pain when it when you when it's given. So um, and it sometimes is even given with lidocaine to kind of help that out. But anyway, um, that's a side note. So how we let's talk about writing prescriptions. So what's the drug? Well, I could write rocephin here, or I could write ceftriaxone. I prefer to always write the um, uh, generic names just because um, I like generic names. If there is a generic name, I try to use it. Just that way I make sure that they're always getting the right drug that I intended. Now, what's the strength? Well, I want to give him 250 milligrams. What's the amount? Well, there is no amount because I want to give him 250 milligrams. Now, the amount would in, be indicated if it you need to look at the particular bottle that's given. Now, if you were giving this as a written prescription, this would not apply. So it would be 250 milligrams in however many milliliters that it's supposed to be given. Now, we know IM medications are supposed to be 1, 2, to 3, to 4, 5 mLs, depending on where you're giving it intramuscularly. So that would need to be included here. That would be really important. So if it's a written order that's going to a pharmacy, you need to write down um, how many mLs this is supposed to be given. And this is something that you could look up again. But if you're giving an order, um, usually, because usually um, something IM medications are not given as a written prescription that are taken to a pharmacy and filled um, normally. Um, it does happen, yes, but it's not, it's not the normal occurrence. Usually this is something going to be in a hospital and whatnot. So you would give 250 milligrams, and it should be whoever is giving the medication's responsibility to look that up, unless you want to specifically indicate it, or the patient's taking that prescription to a pharmacy and getting it themselves, and they're not somebody who can calculate and know the, how many mLs should be given, because you don't want them to accidentally um, get a 100 ml bag and think that they're supposed to inject all that by themselves, blah, 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 as you know. So this is one, the amount, um, 250 milligrams, not usually included, again, unless you're giving an outpatient um, and giving them a written script um, to go out. So as for an order, 250 milligrams. Well, what's the route? Well, of course, this is different. So the route's not by mouth. We want them to take it IM or intramuscular. So that means we're going to give them a shot. Um, we always like shots. Um, so um, what's the frequency? The frequency, essentially, we're giving this one time. So you would write once. Now, um, the other thing along with the frequency is if this were a medication that were maybe not ceftriaxone, but maybe a, more, a medication that needs to be given um, right away, you would write once now, once in five hours, once every day. You can add lots of things onto that as well um, to in increase that order every, you know, to, to change the duration or the frequency. But this is just once. Maybe you could write once stat. Um, if you were maybe giving adenosine, six milligrams, uh, IV push, once stat. Um, that would be a way an order would be written there. Um, so you could change those depending, but essentially we want to only give them to them once. And that's how it would be written. And of course, this is how the order would come through to um, from a provider to, to a nurse. Um, this is how it would come through. This would how it would go to the pharmacy. Um, and then, of course, they would send back, or if, or sorry, if you were going to a written uh, written prescription that a patient is going to take to a pharmacy, you would want to include, um, or try to include 250 milligrams in how many mLs. And this is all, this changes, gets a little weird depending on what's going on. Indication, you don't need to tell anyone that it's for gonorrhea. They're supposed to take the medication. You don't need to give them the quantity because it literally is just once. Uh, but you could write quantity one if you wanted. But it's probably going to be a multi, um, uh, multi milliliter solution. And then, of course, how many refills. So quantity is usually left out and refills, are, of course, 
are none because this is a one time. Now, if you wanted to give him um, some doses to have on hand um, or you know prescriptions that he could refill later for one time use each time, then you would write you know five refills. But of course, that's not something standard practice um, that we would do. Now, it is um, something that is written, something a, a different example, something like an EpiPen. Um, an EpiPen is written as an IM injection once as needed for anaphylaxis, um, and the refills may be two. There may be two refills, quantity of one, refills of two. And essentially, a prescription doesn't expire until um, six to 12 months, depending on where you're at, and um, then you could refill that once the EpiPen that you have expires, you could go and get another one. So that's just another example. Sometimes um, uh, lotions or creams, um, you know, things for psoriasis and whatnot are given and they may have, um, that you may be using them as directed or apply to the affected area um, as needed, uh, but um, they may have multiple refills that may not necessarily indicate a 30-day supply. So just lots of different things on this, but this is uh, the general basics on how to go through and write a prescription, how the basics of how it works, and the big thing, again, just following that standard formula. It's super important. So that's all we've got for how to understanding prescriptions, how they're written, um, and understanding the basics. And we appreciate you watching. As always, you should jump over and check out some of our other videos. Um, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just push the little button. It's it's like right. It's it's going to pop up. It's right there. Um, subscribe to the channel um, at uh, Kendall Wyatt MD uh, for lots of other videos. We appreciate you watching. And as always, guys, good luck studying.